Singapore is not just a smart city, it's a smart nation and I think increasingly it is also a smart hub because it is very intertwined in global networks. More recent years, uh, digital technology has become much more advanced. It's much more of a disruptive force. And you see this in many, many sectors. For example, in transport, you have Grab, you have Uber, changing the way how transport is done. In retail, you have Lazada, you have Shopee. Again, changing how things are bought and sold. Of course, in the last two years, COVID-19 has accelerated these trends even more. You see a more widespread adoption of digital technology. Companies are realizing that digitalization is not just a benefit, actually it is a must. And we see this in, even in our own uh, government grants. We know this because in the year 2020, when we had the COVID at its, its strongest and its highest, the number of grants that we approved in the government went up five times. Five times that of what it was before uh, COVID-19. Traditionally in the shipping industry, digitalization has always taken a backseat. But I think with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it has actually shown that uh, digitalization is indeed uh, ex absolutely essential. And because of um, some of the restrictions in terms of travel, border restrictions, in terms of interactions, human-to-human uh, -human interactions, you will find that the reliance on digitalization gets uh, a lot more pronounced. So in the last couple of years, we've launched a key initiative. We call it Digital Port at SG. And PORT stands for Portal for One Stop Regulatory Transactions, which means when ships come in, of course, they have to fill in certain regulatory information so that we can allow them to come uh, and conduct their business within the port. And it used to be that uh, you had to go to three different agencies. This particular initiative, uh, we estimate, has uh, saved about 100,000 man hours per year entirely for the industry. One of the largest changes that we have seen in terms of um, how digital technologies has been affecting society and governance really is in the realm of politics, specifically the relationship between governments and their peoples. Increasingly what is really interesting and we're seeing a lot of that in other countries is 3.0 kind of digital governance. Right here we're talking about for instance the use of civic tech to enable citizens to have a greater voice in public decision making. Citizens are able to provide solutions, provide their opinions on different types of legislation. As we become more digital in our daily lives, our exposure uh, to cybersecurity threats increases as well. With the advancements of technology and the reduction in cost of technology, uh, cybersecurity criminal activities becomes, I would say, relatively cheaper. I think the more subtle challenge is the word expectation. As we become more digitally trained, educated, accustomed to way of living, our expectation of business services has heightened. Our expectation of government services right, will be packed and benchmarked against all other private sectors, private organisations that you and I, as consumer, as citizen, uh, are exposed to. Well, in the next step, uh, the government is very focused on helping Singapore companies build up their digitalization capabilities. It starts with uplifting the broad base of companies, making sure all companies have a basic digital competency. And of course, helping companies in existing businesses transform their business models to compete uh, in this new future economy. And so we have a program called the Start Digital Program where we work with partners who are natural touch points for these businesses. For example, the bank or for example, the uh, trade association. At that point in time, we introduce uh, some support packages for them to say, okay, you know, you, you want to sign up for this, you want to build up this capability, you want to set up these things in place. Through the partner, we can help them do it. In the next phase, um, what's more important because one of the buzzwords um, is sustainability. And indeed, beyond the administrative sort of efficiency, we need to look at um, efficiency in terms of operational uh, matters. And that's true using data. Because for us, um, 
there's another key initiative, what we call Digital Oceans. Oceans actually um, stands for Open or Common Exchange and Network Standardization. Just imagine if you can exchange information on the time of arrivals, time you depart, the time of services required along the way, and even information related to the journey. So for example, navigational information, whether there's going to be a storm here, there, there'll be bad weather somewhere, and you could avoid those, which then consume more fuel. The heartening thing we've observed that became really quite evident during the COVID-19 pandemic is the initiative that was taken by people to use tech to provide goods and services to groups of people who are in need. Right? All these are the very positive aspects of um, collective action. On the flip side, we also see how this attempt to build greater social cohesion, social resilience is being threatened by problems such as hate speech, doxing and even the cancer culture. I think the danger of that is it can actually lead to the emergence of what I would say an invisible class of citizens. More and more people retreat from the public space into their private chambers of communication where they feel safe and more secure. So I think that has very negative implications for public discourse and social cohesion. With the digital journey that we all uh, has been going through, right? We all know that we are not confined uh, to our Singapore space. Do we really need to have CBDs? Will our new urban form take a different shape? So I will see sh the, the industry to move towards more knowledge base. Uh, from that perspective. And therefore, that call for the entire support system of talent, the entire uh, thinking through of the land use, right, uh, and allocation of our very scarce resource that we have. So, very big topic, yeah, but I, I think we are headed uh, in the correct direction. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carol Soon from the Institute of Policy Studies. Welcome to the seventh online forum of IPS's Singapore Perspectives. This session is open for media coverage. Now, we have had a very long day, so a very big thank you to all of you who have stayed with us. The first three forums today focused on the opportunities and challenges that Singapore faces as a city in the economic realm, in the maritime domain, and in the green space. Now, the discussions were rich and cover a wide range of issues. They also generated much food for thought for policy making, such as what Singapore should do to stay, vigilant, uh, to stay vibrant and resilient, while at the same time manage the attendant risks, such as the obsolescence of city life, environmental sustainability, employment security, and mental health issues. Now for this session, we focus on cities in the digital space, particularly the opportunities and challenges Singapore faces in its ongoing growth into a smart nation and a smart hub. Now technology provides Singapore with many opportunities to overcome its physical limitations as a little red dot. But how will Singapore's digital transformation impact its politics and social fabric? And what would the impact be on Singapore's urban form? Now, to interrogate these questions, we have with us two very special guests. Our first speaker, Mr. Liu Chuan Hong, is Chief Executive of the Infocom Media Development Authority. He oversees the upskilling of Singapore's workforce, the creation of careers, not just jobs, in the Infocom and media sectors, and building a digitally inclusive society. Now, before joining IMDA, Mr. Liu was with the Navy and the Ministry of Trade and Industry. He also led the strategic review of the research, 
Innovation and Enterprise 2015 Plan to grow Singapore's knowledge-driven economy. Now, our second speaker, Professor Carlo Ratti, is an architect and engineer by training. He teaches at MIT, where he directs the Sensible City Lab. Now, Prof Ratti is well known for his work on new technologies impact on urban life and design. He has co-authored more than 500 publications and holds several technical patents. So this is how we will run this session. Each speaker will take about 15 minutes to share his thoughts on the topic, following which we will open the session to a discussion with you, the audience. Now we welcome your questions, which you can submit anytime during the session. You can also vote for the questions that you like. You can do so via the Q&A section on this forum. So without further delay, let me turn the time over to Chuan Hong. Chuan Hong, over to you. Well, good afternoon, uh, Carol, uh, Carlo, and of course, uh, the audience that's joining us today. Great pleasure to be here. Um, perhaps I'll just share a few thoughts and uh, I'll start perhaps by taking a step back uh, and engage with the question of why cities, um, the fundamental basics, why the cities even exist. Uh, if you start historically, um, cities evolved when really farming started to generate subsidies or surpluses rather that were beyond the subsistence level. And as spare labor sort of accumulated over time, these were channeled into specializations, uh, for example, in ironworking to generate a plow. And this in turn created a positive flywheel of greater productivity, greater specialization. But this specialization had to be supported by a broader critical mass because you know, not every village would need an ironsmith. This maybe was found in a provincial town. And not everything that's found in a city, uh, you can actually find in a provincial town. So there is that general accumulation of specialization and of critical mass. I think that's one of the key functions of why cities exist today. But with specialization comes exchange of goods. And of course, that birth of that basic economic principle of comparative advantage where trading makes uh, the general ecosystem more well off. And more importantly, over time, it was not just the exchange of goods, it was really the exchange of ideas. And I think that was really what started to push boundaries and that led to innovations uh, happening across the board. I wanted to highlight because I think these two key drivers or what is at the core of a city continues to be relevant. And cities evolved really to bring that critical mass together and of course, to be that sites of exchange, be it physical or intellectual. And in many ways, if you look at the development in history, the, the real drivers are not countries per se, but the real units of progress are actually cities. They're the hot houses, and which is why you see a general trend of urbanization. And many projections point that it's going to continue two thirds of the population will be urban by about 2050. The second question is then why did cities end up where they are today? I don't think there's a very simple answer. Uh, that drift is natural and it's extremely organic. And ultimately it's people that choose to be where cities are. Obviously, generally it's driven by a certain economic activity. So for example, uh, the maritime trade drove London, uh, financial drove New York or, or Shanghai. And of course, San Francisco is driven by gold. Uh, but of course, until more recently, Silicon Valley driven by technology. I think it's also quite telling that um, what we call artificial cities, uh, political capitals, for example, they were built from scratch, have generally lagged behind these more preeminent cities that have grown organically. And uh, that is sort of something that we have to remember as a relatively artificial city that is Singapore. A lot of these cities also start to generate a certain uh, gravity of critical mass once they hit a certain size. Uh, London today, I think is about 8 million people. New York, 8 million. Tokyo is 13. Silicon Valley is sort of four to five. Shanghai is 26 million people. So of course these numbers are not precise and depending on how you count them, they may not actually include the metropolitan area that, that surrounding suburb that draws people in. But I think one thing is quite certain that uh, there is a certain stickiness and there's a certain positive flywheel that once you reach a certain size, you start to generate a gravity uh, of your own. Uh, but it doesn't mean cities are immutable uh, time in memoriam. Um, ultimately, when shocks happen, 
when changes happen, uh, cities do fade away. I mean, there are many classic examples in the US, you talk about Detroit. And in many other uh, cities in Asia today, they're facing uh, different risks and different challenges. So ultimately, I'll come back to the idea that uh, cities uh, are where they are because of certain drivers. They have a certain critical mass. And if you're subscale, actually you are at a disadvantage because you are subscale as far as gravity is concerned. But it doesn't mean it's immutable. It come back to the basic idea that people ultimately choose. So when I bring in the basic idea of why cities are there and where they are situated with digital, um, the natural question that comes up with is, so does digital upend it all? Why? Because digital is a lot more than just a smartphone. Actually, it opens up a whole brand new commons where people can gather. And in many ways, while traditional cities were those original commons, today I think the hypothesis is digital can do this a lot better than your traditional cities. You talk about the first characteristic, I mentioned critical mass. Today, you can generate critical mass and generate critical mass on call and as needed. Uh, many of you are very familiar with this example of uh, Travis Scott, he's a rapper, and he did his uh, astronomical concert on Fortnite. And within 15 minutes, his performance was only 15 minutes, there were 12.3 million uh, viewers which is far greater than most other cities. Uh, within that short 15 minutes, I think some estimates are that he earned $20 million, uh, whereas most of his previous physical concerts, even the best-selling ones, were one and a half, $2 million. So of course, that is a rather extreme example, but I think in all our lives today, empowered by be it social media, chat groups, Zoom calls, we now have at our back and call the ability to bring together a certain critical mass of people for that need as needed. And again, that naturally raises the question, do you still need to physically congregate? We talked about cities as sites of uh, exchange, but again, increasingly, uh, how we access our services today is no longer physically going to a branch. Today, uh, the platforms that we're familiar with, be it something that you buy online, your e-commerce platforms, are these sites of exchange. And they exchange it arguably a lot better because uh, if I put something on Amazon, I can sell across physical boundaries and even to international uh, customers. And in many ways, many of these platforms have democratized the arbitration between latent supply and latent demand, uh, be it labor, be it ideas, uh, and across transnational boundaries. When we think of the gig economy today, we, we tend to think of it as still relatively blue collar, you know, food delivery but with platforms as an intermediation, that white collar gig is already happening. Today, software developers are not necessarily in that physical country where that product is required. And increasingly, I can see this happening with consultants, with doctors, and so much more. So in many ways, virtual cities already effectively uh, exist in some form or other. Uh, I'm not gonna fully wade into the metaverse discussion, but I'll just say that the, the definitions are vague. But if you take it at its basic idea that the digital world is going to replace the physical world, in many ways, it's here today. It's just a matter of degree. And I come back to the basic idea of are cities relevant still? So here I'll share sort of just three thoughts and implications for, for cities. The first, and this obviously including Singapore, uh, when digital takes up so much of the value chain, the key idea must be that cities must up, go up, that value chain. And I, I just have a sort of a shorthand to say, what is that reality premium? What is that reality premium that actually physical cities bring? Uh, I was chatting with um, some sort of companies, big companies in the course of work and asked about how their HR was being affected. And they said almost sort of straightforward categorically that some of the top talent today, the first thing that they'll ask you is, can I stay where I am? And then I'll just fly in for key meetings. And all the more so because as top talent, uh, they, they, they are mobile, but they can also choose to stay where they are rooted in and where they grew up and where they're comfortable with. And actually that makes it a lot more difficult for a little bit more artificial cities like Singapore. So as we think about it, the basics of being safe, of being efficient uh, are still very important. You can't let go of that. 
And digital can do a lot to reduce the disamenities of better public transport, uh, infrastructure. Perhaps, but I would perhaps submit that the most important thing we must remember is what is that very human or complex human endeavor that's very difficult to replace or replicate rather digitally. And that is the act of creation, the act of innovation, of new stuff being developed, of innovating new products and services, that richness of an experience and perhaps that engineered serendipity uh, that you cannot find uh, anywhere else. And I think that must be that reality premium that you must engineer in any city for it to continue to be relevant. And this is both in terms of the hard spaces of how it's architected, to force a much more effective uh, interaction, as well as the soft elements uh, that must put into place to up that overall experience quotient. Second implication is that obviously, if you think about Cities 2.0, uh, that digital element must come in a lot more strongly. And if the, the Cities today have a natural head start, and if you think about it, in the old days, your immediate metropolitan area was literally your immediate metropolitan area. But can it be a much wider diaspora now that sort of transcends? And if you think increasingly that a city must also function like a platform, you co-opt uh, the best of uh, the competition. Uh, how do you allow people to connect even if they may not physically want to be here? And doing so, obviously, you must provide that kind of added digital experience that is much more safe, is secure in living and working digitally in this particular city as a platform, how your data is being pro protected, what are the regulations, and therefore providing as safe a digital space uh, that is as vibrant and as sort of uh, uh, effective and efficient is extremely critical. And perhaps the sort of the using borrowing the language just now of you know Fortnite, when you think about a platform, they usually say what's a subscriber base or what is your monthly active uh, users. Uh, Fortnite, in that one concert, there was 12.3 million players. If I use TikTok as an example, uh, they have 700 million monthly active users. So if I borrow this same language, if you think of Singapore, or you think of a city as a platform, what can we claim to be our monthly active users? So I think that's an important element to think about. So, I think these two implications together, how do we up the reality premium? But then how do you make sure that it becomes a site for innovation and to think of ourselves in platform terms, I think it's very useful. I'll perhaps end off by saying that that concentration of talent and the exchange of ideas ultimately must be directed towards solving some of the big problems uh, of the world today. If cities as engines of innovation continues to be true, we must apply our minds to solve some of these key issues uh, to continue that relevance. Demographics, aging. How do you make productivity go way beyond physical years? Because it fundamentally changes and, re and empowers and rejuvenates cities. How do you break that inequality of opportunity? Because now education and digital tools are not geographically located. How do you make sure that you empower that at the individual level, ensure that there isn't a digital divide or a digital Gini coefficient, and engender new social mobility? How do you do that at a societal level to ensure that we continue to maintain a broad middle class that's empowered in this digital era? Because only with a stable uh, middle class in the digital space can you reverse that fragmentation of cities as well as societies. How do you make sure that common space continues, especially in a country like Singapore? Uh, because in the past, diversity was a strength, but if fragmentation happens, it becomes a weakness. And then perhaps lastly, how do you build empathy? And this is an area that I think personally is very powerful because uh, through digital, you can now live the lives of somebody else through their eyes. Uh, there's this powerful little tool, uh, I think it's in the US, that's called Be My Eyes. And literally it allows the blind to uh, canvas and have somebody help them uh, look at the temperature or to help them with daily tasks. And it's amazing because, you know, it, it is the classic matching of latent supply and demand 
fractionalizes volunteering. You know, instead of doing it for a day, you do it for a minute. But you're looking through somebody's eyes. And many of these can be happen, can, can sort of be replicated. There are other things like traveling while black, something sort of done in the US. Or, you know, reliving our own history to see through the eyes of our pioneers. I think these elements are sort of big things that cities can apply themselves in thinking about it. Uh, I won't talk about sustainability. We can have a, a deeper discussion, but I think there's a lot of scope for cities to really pioneer sustainability. So my final point is just end off to say, at the very broad level, what does it mean for Singapore? Um, I think everything I mentioned earlier probably applies. But I mean, if we live, if we sort of think of ourselves beyond just as a city and, and as a nation state, I think the most important is to open that ambition. Because, you know, Singapore, we've always viewed ourselves as uh, a little red dot. You know, you always sandwich 30 kilometers by 40 kilometers, uh, that tight constrained space where increasingly it's always about trade-off. It's a zero-sum game. But in the digital space, it really unlocks it. And, you know, there's really a lot of space. And if I were to ask, you know, from a historical perspective, uh, the last time this kind of commons opened up was in the maritime commons and a succession of very, very small countries, namely first the Portuguese and the Dutch and then the British, because they understood that particular domain uh, came to dominate the rest of the world. Uh, of course, the, the sort of the implications of colonialism on one side, I mean, can we have that same ambition where Singapore rises out of our physical constraints and instead of being a little red dot, become a much bigger red dot. So I think that is that ambition that opens the eyes for Singapore and something which we should embrace. So Carol, I think just quick thoughts for consideration and uh, happy to hear from uh, yourself, Carlo, as well as our audience. Thank you. Thank you, Chuan Hong. Those are quick thoughts, but profound thoughts. Um, I, I, I like how you started with talking about the two key drivers of cities, you know, essentially the two key elements of cities, but more importantly, your thesis about in order to stay relevant, you know, what cities should do, and that is to up the reality premium. And you then proposed how we can do it uh, by building the by growing the hard side, which is a safe infrastructure, but also what we need to do on the soft side, which is to enable people to develop their creativity and their innovative capability. And I particularly like the way you ended, you know, your comments with a host of questions, right, which I think would make for a good discussion later. So I'll hand the time now over to Carlo. Carlo, over to you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, could, I, could we see the slides? Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, and uh, Chuen Hong, th thanks for a great introduction and, uh, and uh, you know, for your points. Um, I want to elaborate on a couple of them in, uh, in my presentation. So, um, clearly the key thing is how things are going to change in terms of the relationship between digital and physical following COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. Um, should, should I control? Is there a way for me to control the slides? No, I should just okay. So anyway, we've seen um, uh, we've seen images such as this one from all over the world. You know, cities uh, uh, being empty because of COVID, uh, and that led many people to say, you know, this is the end of cities. Now it turns out now one or two years later that that uh, that hasn't happened, but many changes that happen are worth investigating because that can elucidate a lot between the relationship in the relationship between digital and physical. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, the question I want to discuss is, uh, is uh, very relevant to the future of cities. You know, cities start at the very beginning at places where people trade things, where people work. And so if we change the way of working, if we can work from wherever we want on the planet, then you know that can have a big impact on how cities world today and take into account also the fact it's not only about uh, where you know you got uh, you know uh, people working uh, in the first place but you lot a lot of other activities that are sure brought in by business districts and so on so somehow the changes in the way we live and work will have a big impact on the structure of our cities next slide <clears throat> so what i wanted to do with, with you today is share a few a little bit of data collected here on the MIT campus 
um, uh, and, uh, and using data to try to understand better some of these changes. Next slide. Uh, this is an op-ed I did in the Harvard Business Review a few years ago, and the title they gave, <clears throat> they gave was, uh, if work is digital, why do we still go to the office? And uh, what I argue in the article actually is that, yes, you know, digital can replace many things, but there's still a few reasons, there's some reasons why it's very important to meet in physical space. But in order to look at that, let's do a step back. Next slide. <clears throat> if we... Um, if you look at this, this is uh, the Chart d'Atene, a very important document in architecture and planning in the 1930s, uh, drafted by Le Corbusier in the group called CM. And uh, uh, what we were arguing is really, uh, at the time, <clears throat> is really about separating a city in, in a way that every district contained just one single function. So the four keys to urban planning are the four functions of the city, dwelling, work, recreation, and transportation. And their idea, next slide, was to separate all those functions uh, in a self-contained district. And actually, many cities around the world have been built using these principles, such as Brasilia in uh, the capital of Brazil, or many others built in the past century. However, in the 1960s and onwards, uh, many people started realizing that if we actually separate everything in the city, then we get uh, a ra rather dull uh, neighborhoods. We get neighborhoods, for instance, you know, the working neighborhoods would be empty during the evening. Uh, the places where people uh, people live, where people sleep, will be empty during the day, what French people call quartier d'ortoir. So somehow since the 1960s and 70s, people started thinking about how can we have mixed-use developments, combining many different things in the same neighborhood. But digital now is changing again. Digital is allowing us to do many activities, to carry out many activity activities on the same space. <clears throat> and, you know, exactly what was mentioned before, the fact you can be more flexible in your work dynamics is that you can appropriate as a working place different parts of the city. Next slide. And this is really questioning the relationship between private and public in our cities. Next slide. And the very structure of, uh, of our buildings. So usually, okay, can we go to the next slide? Usually I go a bit fast with the you know, it's, uh, next slide as well. So I, I just talked over this one. So um, in, in order to look at uh, some of these changes, as I mentioned, let's look at data. What you see here is, uh, is a view of Boston. You see Boston downtown to the right. You see the MIT campus uh, with the red boundaries, like you know, a small city inside the city. It's on the Cambridge side of the, city, of, of the metropolitan area of Boston. You see Harvard up there and then all the other university ecosystem. Next slide. And the, the MIT campus was actually one of the first ones to be fully covered by, by Wi-Fi, for instance, in the early 2000s. But over the years, it always embraced digital uh, very, very quickly. And so it's a good lab in order to look at some of the changes. Yes, next slide. Uh, some of the changes that, uh, that uh, have been happening. So for instance, we used to work at MIT, as you see that to the left, uh, you know, that's a computer room from probably 20 years ago. And now people tend to work, as you see to the right. That's a bit extreme, you know, the, it's a beautiful sunny day. I need to tell you that right now when it's freezing and cold, you know, people are not outdoor uh, working, but still it gives you a sense of the ch changes that we've uh, seen on campus, which are the same changes that have happened all over the world. Next slide. So we used to work like this, next slide. And now we, we tend to work uh, like this. This, by the way, is one of the largest co-working places in Europe uh, that uh, our design office designed in Milan a few a couple of years ago. But again, you know, a very different way to create office spaces. So next slide. Um, then <clears throat> some of those changes, as it was mentioned before, have been brought in by digital. But there's something interesting about digital. It also allows us to measure things. So we can actually use measurements on the network in order to better understand what is going on. Here you see all the access points on the MIT campus. Next slide. And then if you start monitoring activity, for instance, you can see something very interesting. There's actually information that uh, people in real estate are starting to, uh, to use a lot in, uh, in their work that tell you, tells you, you know, how real estate is used over time. So what you see here, every bubble tells you how many people you have. There's a map of the MIT campus and you see people moving from one part of the campus to the other through the day. Next slide. 
<clears throat> that's just you know just an op-ed I did uh, in the Financial Times, you know, explaining this and how we can use Wi-Fi mobile phone in order to map human movement. It's a big change in the way we can describe a city. Next slide. And here you can see the aggregated, call it the heartbeat of the MIT campus, so activity over time, <clears throat> and uh, you know divided in different categories. Next slide. And, um, and here you can see the same thing that you can do now in every room. You know, tomorrow, probably on every square meter or square foot, you can re really look at occupancy over time. Actually, in China, where there's a lot of uh, um, deep learning based on facial recognition implemented, you can already do that, you know, exactly who's where at every time of the day. Now, we're not coming on the, on the I mean, this is, there is no privacy implication on this data. This is all anonymized if you go to facial recognition, there is a, a lot of things we could discuss about uh, later about implications about privacy. But the bottom line, what I want to say is that for the first time, we're actually able to measure how we use physical space in a very precise way. And with this type of course, next slide. And then we can analyze it. When you've got data, you can apply big data analytics uh, and you can analyze it and uh, discover interesting things. So here we start the clustering this data, next slide. <clears throat> this is again the composition. Uh, there's a few papers on this. You find it on our website if you're interested in the mathematics. Next slide. Um, and, uh, and what you see here is actually the MIT campus, but the MIT campus <clears throat> that probably 20 years ago would have had, had very different colors, identifying different areas of the cam campus, each of them with a very precise function, is becoming much more blurred is exactly the result of what we were saying before, the fact that digital is liberating us, is allowing us to work in a more flexible way. And so actually different activities overlap over the same space, as I was mentioning a moment ago. Next slide. <clears throat> now, in addition to this, we, uh, this is work we started before COVID, but you know, in addition to looking at how people use physical space, there's other parameters we can add to that knowledge. And for instance, you can look at productivity. You know, then, you know, we meet in physical space, we communicate in digital space, but uh, what is the results in a university's pat papers and patents? And that's what you see here. So we can actually measure productivity as an outcome. Next slide. Um, and also we can look at the heterogeneity of different communities. Something interesting when we were talking before about uh, serendipity, you know, serendipity is about uh, it is uh, very related to this kind of diversity of different people randomly bumping into each other. Next slide. <clears throat> so all of this is some of the research we were doing and uh, has been published uh, before COVID. And you can find some of those papers, as I mentioned, on, on our website. But then what about COVID-19? Next slide. Now, in addition to the data you saw before, we are collecting another type of data on the MIT campus already in 2019, so before COVID. And that's data with the email data set, telling you who's connecting with whom on the MIT campus. Next slide. And uh, so somehow we started looking at how, you know, once from one day to the next, the campus shut down, we started asking what has been the impact on our communication networks? So, you know, because we only work remotely, we switch physical for digital fully at MIT, and all over the world, then, you know, what are the longer lasting consequences on the way we connect with each other? Next slide. And again, you know, this I just mentioned it, so we, we started using the email network and analyze it and see how it changed. Next slide. So just to give you a sense of the timing, we were collecting this in 2019, then this is 2020. Uh, next slide, and you see, you see, before the COVID emergency in February, and then in just a matter of weeks, like all over the world, the campus entered lockdown. Next slide. Actually, in particular, on the 23rd of uh, March uh, uh, 2020. That's when uh, uh, the, the, food, the, the closing was announced. Next slide. So just to share with you a little bit of data, we can go a bit quickly here. Next slide. A little bit of data before the COVID emergency. Here is what you get from the email communication network on the MIT campus. Next slide. This is just a visualization. Next slide as well. So it's number of emails. And here you see all the different communities. So you know you, you can actually cluster the network and look at the different departments and communities on the MIT campus. Next slide. 
But then actually COVID starts and there's lockdown. And look at this, next slide, you know, just visually, um, this is, uh, you know, just a visual representation of, uh, of the network is quite different. It looks like, you know, the communities are more tightly knit uh, and there, there's less heterogeneous communication. Next slide. Next slide as well. I mean, just different visualization of that. So we started looking at, you know, what change? The question is, if we all work digitally, you know, what are the longer lasting consequences on, uh, on our networks, as I was saying before. So, and we look for many things and many things actually didn't change. Many things on the network are the same today as they were before COVID. But actually there's one key parameter that has changed significantly. And that's what is called weak ties. Uh, this is a famous paper by 1973 by Mark Granovetter, <clears throat> very important paper in sociology. And um, if you look at the, um, at the next slide, um, what, what, it, what it tells you, you know, if you take all of your connections, you can classify them in two categories, strong ties, who are your friends, who are also friends with some of your other friends. So it's part of this kind of cluster, tightly knit community. But then you have weak ties, which are usually friends. They can be very good friends. You can see them a lot. Weak doesn't mean that you see them little, but uh, they're not friends of your friends. And they usually become a bridge like another community. And there's a very vast literature showing that actually a lot of the creativity we we're talking about before comes from weak ties. You know, with strong ties, we tend to repeat to each other it's always the same story, but with weak ties, <clears throat> well, weak ties open up a new conversation, expose us to new ideas, and they're key to creativity. Next slide. And so uh, we analyze all of this. Uh, this is some of the graphs based on, again, you know, big data analytics. Next slide. Um, Again, next slide, here you see some of the, the, the graphs. Next, uh, we can go a bit fast. Uh, but key, the, really the key thing is in the previous graph, on the previous slide, where you see that basically following the closing of the MIT campus on the 23rd of March, 2020, then the number of weak ties being created on the network has uh, uh, almost vanished, has been reduced by 80%. And, uh, and you see it here, and actually what we are seeing now that there's partial opening, last semester was, uh, you know, not full opening of the MIT campus, but partial opening, then, uh, you know, things are actually going back to, to what they were before. So actually it's quite good, not only that the, the virtualization of the campus uh, reduces weak ties, but also now going back to meeting physical uh, on, on the campus in, in person um, is actually, uh, again, creating a lot of weak ties. If you look at the next slide, in the next slide, you can see actually an overall visualization of the network. Think about this almost like a brain. And you see, unfortunately, you know, the, with COVID, you know, this, uh, this kind of network has been shrinking. Just if we only meet digitally, we tend to, we keep on meeting our friends, the people we already know, but we lack that ability to generate new links, new ties, and to meet new people and to be more creative. Um, we, we, we gave a name to this, uh, this process we call the nexogenesis, the creation of new tie, the refresh of existing ties. Next slide. And I will stop with this one. So by the way, this is a, this is a paper. It's, a, it's an archive at the moment. It's going to be published soon, but we, we, we are very excited about the results. But you can find all the analytics, all the data, all the mathematics here. You know, I just gave a quick glimpse uh, before. But the bottom line is that, yes, you know, just in a nutshell, what I, <clears throat> my point is that, yes, you know, digital can help us uh, do a lot of things in a new way. Um, you know, we virtualized the whole planet in a matter of weeks. So that was uh, a, a very, very interesting change in our habits. But we need to take into account the fact that uh, it looks like, at least with today's digital, the digital doesn't allow us to fully um, reproduce the richness of human interactions we have in physical space. And in particular, for those measures, such as weak ties, which are uh, very, very important in terms of creativity. So next slide, and this is the end, uh, just you know, to keep in touch. Uh, but uh, that's what I wanted to put on the table. So I think there's, uh, uh, I, I guess we're going to have a very exciting conversation uh, now. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we have you know, really insightful comments from both speakers. Um, before we go into the Q&A, and we do see quite a few questions coming up, some more macro and others uh, more specific. 
maybe let me pose a question to both speakers, right? I would like to bring into this panel discussion the impact of digitalization from the governance angle. So for example, in the case of Singapore, um, the Singapore government has been actively engaging Singaporeans from all walks of life uh, in policy making since the 1980s. So we think about um, Twin Hong, you know, you would remember um, Reach 1.0, so-called, the Next Lab, Singapore 21, our Singapore Conversation and Youth Action Challenge. Now we're seeing in different parts of the world, in countries such as US, Finland and China, the growing popularity of civic tech and the use of civic tech in open policy making. So tech is used by policymakers to crowdsource policy solutions and citizens get to be involved in every stage of the policy making process via an online platform. So for instance, they're involved in problem definition, data gathering, designing solutions, implementing and evaluating the solutions. So how do you think Singapore is doing on this front? So this is my specific question for Chuen Hong. And somewhat related to this, also on governance, Carlo, cities are small and dense. Right. You have pointed out, you know, many of your studies that talk about, you know, the actual um, dispersion of communities, populations and implications for uh, serendipitous occurrences and productivity. So cities are small, they're dense, and that oftentimes also lead to a lot of contestation of how space is used. So in Singapore, we have seen, for instance, conflicting priorities and preferences among different segments of the public when it comes to how a particular pocket of land should be used. So for instance, the tension between preserving parks versus redeveloping the land for public housing. So in one of your writings, you, know, you drew attention on the human face of urban technologies and their potential in promoting bottom-up social empowerment. So my question to you, Carlo, is how can we enable social empowerment while minimizing collateral damage for societal cohesion. So both questions, um, one is slightly different for, for both of you, but really bringing in uh, uh, the, the, the impact, right? Getting us to think about the consequences of um, digitalization on governance and how should governance be done? So perhaps Chun Ho, you can go first. Um, thanks, Carol. I mean, that's a very expansive uh, question. So I'm just going to take a, a quick stab at a few key parts. Um, I want to start by saying that ultimately governance is measured by success. And governance uh, sometimes in say, as we pay attention to the politicized debates, uh, especially in many other countries, you know, be it US and so on and so forth, there is a tendency to get carried away by the politics and the process. But actually, when you come back to ultimately governance, the, the hard nosed measure must be, does it make the lives of citizens better? And in that respect, I think it's a truism to say that digital does have huge benefits uh, to this equation. I think Carlo alluded to many aspects of that, the, the way data is used. Uh, many countries, you know, harness citizens actively as, you know, census, you know, to report. Uh, and if used well, actually, it builds a much deeper sense of participation, a much deeper sense of community, and just a much deeper sense of being engaged uh, with the entire process. And it must be used uh, fully in that respect. Um, but technology sort of equally empowers, in some ways, the opportunities, as well as sometimes the risks. Uh, and we would probably uh, be remiss if we didn't pay as much attention to some of the risks. And the risk in many ways are not technology. Uh, it, technology merely accentuates and heightens that risk. If you were to look at the US example, uh, technology allowed the coming together of a mob that then became incensed uh, and then decided to um, basically storm and charge uh, the Capitol building. So therefore, how do you balance between sort of really using it to hear from citizens, but at the same time, where are the markers to prevent that from turning into tribes and into mobs? 
Because as we all know today, uh, a lot of social media very often says it's about echo chambers. Uh, there's this famous little sort of phrase that I think it, it describes many parts of society today. And that little phrase is, uh, I've really made up my mind. Don't bother me with the facts. And I think these are the elements uh, we need to continue to consider in how to use digital for governance. The other key area is how do we make sure that in this demand for rights versus responsibilities, how do you then use digital to encourage people to use their rights, but at the same time to assert and to express their responsibility? Because ultimately governance uh, is actually boring. Good governance is extremely boring. And therefore, the ability to sustain that responsibility and not just about the rights, I think is extremely important. So I think the technology has huge potential, but it must be biased and harnessed in the right side of the opportunities, but at the same time being very cognizant that it accentuates the risks as well, because unfortunately, sometimes it brings out the worst uh, in human nature. And then how do we move that forward for better countries as well as better cities? Thank you. Thank you, Chen Hong. Carlo. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, yeah, great points. First of all, uh, let me add to something very, very briefly. It's, very, it, it's really true that actually digitization is, uh, <clears throat> is bringing a lot of fragmentation. And, uh, you know, somehow is exactly what we we're seeing before in the MIT campus. The fact that if you only connect with our friends digitally, if we tend to, uh, to, to lose the weak ties and just connect with the people you already know very well, uh, then, you know, ideas keep reinforcing and uh, it's very easy to uh, uh, you to miss that diversity that usually helps helps us uh, uh, to to balance our idea and to, to engage with diversity. So somehow, you know, that's an inherent problem of digital. And I want to say that physical space tradition has been the way really to uh, to to, be, to to play the role of an antidote to that. And it can be physical place in the office or physical place in the city, you know, public spaces in cities perform that function very, very well. Uh, and again, physical place is a place where, again, you're confronted with diversity, the space of inevitability, where you, you must confront even things that are different from, from you, ideas that are different. All those things that actually in the digital space is so easy to, uh, to, to avoid. You can just simply filter them out. So somehow, you know, just, just this point about, about this. And so I think that that gives, again, an important role to physical place in, uh, in the future, both in cities, in offices, and so on, uh, again, in order to, to foster and promote a healthier discussion. But going back to the, 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 the initial question, um, I, um, I would say that uh, what uh, is, uh, is applied today in, in, in government, in governance, is uh, very similar to what is happening in many other dimensions. For instance, uh, some of our work has been focusing on what we call open source architecture, the idea to design a building or a neighborhood or a city by actually engaging people in new ways. And, uh, and so again, the beauty of digital is that we can really reach out to a larger community. In the 1970s, a, a Christopher Alexander, a very well-known uh, urbanist and architect, um, tried to do a lot of experiments in uh, collaborative design. But then there's a telling line in one of his books that says, you know, well, when you put over 15 people around the table, then you know, it becomes a mess. Well, digital today allows us to put not 15, but 1,500 or 15,000 people around the same table to discuss things that could be important for them related to the city, to the physical city, to government, and so on. So just a couple of thoughts here. <clears throat> the first one is uh, we need to take into account the fact that the input you might want is not always at the same level. Let me make the example of, uh, of designing a building. When you say, open source architecture and you want to involve citizens, well, the point is not that uh, some of them will be involved in the very technical design of whatever a mechanical and electrical system, but they might say, I like option A more than option B. So somehow uh, the fact of engaging a broader constituency means also being able to define all the different layers whereby uh, everybody could contribute. And uh, <clears throat> so again, you know, you don't want some very technical input, but you might want just to uh, help in, in choosing between different ideas, sometimes also in the generation of the ideas. 
So somehow the very important thing here that applies both to design in the city or more general, in more generally uh, to government uh, is how can you really make sure the different constituencies are engaged in, uh, in different ways. In the second part of the question, if I understood it correctly, which is how do we avoid the fragmentation? Well, uh, I think perhaps is exactly what we, uh, we were saying before is really also to make sure that we have places, especially physical places where diversity is encouraged and we're forced to basically confront different ideas that will challenge our own preconceptions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, both of you touch on points pertaining to social cohesion, uh, which is actually a question, you know, that was um, uh, brought, uh, one of the questions that were voted, right? Um, so Professor Tan Anser, um, he, his concern is obviously cities connect people. Um, and like what Trun Hong mentioned earlier, with technology, now people can easily mobilize others who share similar values and ideologies. So the question is, you know, does connection necessarily need uh, lead to cohesion? Um, that is, I think, quite an important point. Thank you, Ansa, for that comment. Um, now, Carlo, you, you ended your remarks uh, by pro proffering a solution, right? You, you mentioned in order to avoid fragmentation, uh, one key thing really is to make sure that we have places or spaces uh, where people can use, where they can meet people. I, 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 I think the implication is places where we can meet people who are different from us, you know, and um, where we can, you know, get to know other people and or at least work together to come up with more creative ideas. So we have a question from an anonymous um, uh, contributor. The question is, so, is pushing your last comment a little bit to make it uh, more tangible and concrete, right? His question is, how should we engineer our heart spaces and infrastructure to encourage um, so-called uh, digitalization, right? And not just how do we engineer the design the infrastructure, but also how do we measure the success uh, of um, good design of spaces? Yeah, <clears throat> I, I, my suggestion to the question would be to focus before focusing on the infrastructure to focus actually on life. So how life is changing, for instance, the way of working, the way of meeting other people, the way of shopping, you know, there's a huge transformation in our cities is, you know, what happens, what's going to happen to our cities if tomorrow there's going, just going to be the likes of Amazon delivering everything to our homes and we destroy all of the retail infrastructure, it'd be a huge change. But I mean, this is some, just some of, the, some of the different things going on right now. And I think my impression is that you know, before looking at the infrastructure, we need to look at uh, the, the new type of lifestyle that uh, is generated by new technologies. And then from the lifestyle, then we do the translation into, into infrastructure. And then when we look at this kind of lifestyle, this kind of way of living, um, <clears throat> I think it's going to be very, very important uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, uh, when we look at the way the way of uh, of living uh, is going to be uh, very very important to have a conversation because again if you look at the post COVID world uh, today you know you got some companies saying well you can work from home forever uh, other companies who are actually forcing people to go back to physical space uh, so somehow we also need to have a debate an open again perhaps an open source uh, debate uh, about uh, uh, what type of uh, new paradigms we want to follow in the way we work, in the way we shop, in the way we do all these different things. And then once we, 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 we understood exactly the new way of living, then we can look at how it translates into architecture. And the last part of the question I think was about uh, what is, uh, you know, how can you make sure you do a good uh, design there? Well, I think the, the, the good design is usually a good match with the lifestyle, with the way of living. So good design response is almost like a tailor-made uh, suit that actually fits very well the way of living of the citizens of the city. Mm, right. um, Chen Hong, not sure if you have any comments to add to you know that strand about um, how do we create you know spaces, um, and it could be virtual or even physical spaces, right, to bring people together. I think you ended your comments with you know some 
questions that pose a fair bit of concern. You know, for instance, how do we uh, preserve empathy? How do we uh, preserve or create a common space? Um, so maybe just to seg uh, segue into this um, increasing overlap between what is the physical and what is the virtual, uh, Christopher, uh, my colleague from IPS, you know, basically asked quite a point blank question, right? Who owns the city's digital space, right? So um, who owns the city's physical infrastructure is quite clear. Uh, but when it comes to the phys, uh, digital space, you know, who has ownership of it, right? Um, and there's obviously clear risk like what you've alluded to that in, we are seeing how the, the digital cyberspace is being turned into virtual gated communities that are, you know, motivated and driven by private interests. So your comments on that. On the IMDA front, what do you think you know um, can be done, right, to uh, to make the digital space a lot more equitable? And who is responsible for governing that space? So, so Carol always picks the really difficult, expansive questions. <clears throat> um, again, I will just probably take a step back. Uh, I alluded to the idea of what is a digital space just now, um, but maybe I should unpack that a little bit. I use the word commons. And what does commons mean? Commons means that unlike in the traditional world where you says this land belongs to this country, you know, uh, the digital space fundamentally is a commons. There is a lot of shared space. And there are not many of such shared spaces out there. I alluded to the idea of the maritime space as a shared space. Um, and with a shared space, uh, it comes obviously with huge advantages for a very, very small country like Singapore, because then it means that we can expand our influence from a small red dot to a much bigger digital red dot. But therein also lies the nut, right? That the classic uh, problem with a uh, shared space or commons is this whole idea of the tragedy of the commons, that basically there are public goods that actually are needed to be generated and created, but if left to sort of just purely uh, private capital enterprise may or may not uh, get generated uh, at sufficient level to a certain amount. And if I were to take this idea at a, a few levels, at the international level, the idea of basic rules and norms to set things in place. Uh, and obviously, as a small country, we have to be circumspect. It is the big powers that set rules. But at the same time, even as a small country, uh, how do we influence that rule setting and norms so that there are certain standards or there are certain uh, approaches? Because fundamentally, many of the problems that we face today, you talk about, uh, be it scams or be it online harms or be it, all of these are fundamentally transnational. And then therefore, as part of a lot of the work that we're doing today, it is nudging, be it through at the economic level, you know, what are the basic standards for digital trade, all the way to looking at from a regulatory space, how do we harmonize some of these regulations, be it for content and so on and so forth, so that the world moves forward as far as uh, the commons and what are the rules and norms in the commons? Because absent that, the alternative is basically is called the law of the jungle. It's whoever is might makes right. And generally the might could be a big country or the might could be a big company. Uh, uh, so therefore the key idea is with the idea of the commons. In where Singapore then, sort of within where we are, um, how do we try and make sure we provide some modes so that we're able to control certain aspects and provide public goods within those modes. So again, uh, a simple idea like misinformation, uh, fake news, and uh, fake news is extremely uh, corrosive. So Singapore is a first mover, you know, as far as POFMA is concerned, and uh, to be able to say, look, uh, I think we take a stance that uh, you can still have your view, meaning that you can post it on Facebook, you can post a particular comment, 
but I have the right of reply because POFMA is right of reply because it is to say that the government posts next to yours a correction and it's up to the individual user to decide for themselves what the facts are. So putting in place some of these so-called uh, modes or breakers, putting in place rules and regulations so that we're providing sort of the public goods that are required within our boundaries, I think it's key. I think you alluded just now to the idea of wall of gardens, and this is, I think, in a little bit, not so much the social, but the economic realm. And of course, the basic idea is, you know, if everybody's on this particular platform, then it's a wall of garden. And you're indeed right, again, because they have great mass and they are sort of transnational. But in many ways, we're looking at this very carefully. Uh, I'm just going to use one example, the idea of what we call digital utilities. And the idea is, if I'm um, to give every Singapore citizen a basic ability to be it transact, be it pay, uh, we hold these quite tightly so that this is not locked up as part of wall gardens. I think that provides a very, very core common digital infrastructure for the country. And many of the things that we are pioneering, for example, when it comes to trade, uh, trade trust, when it comes to SG Trade X, a common sort of baseline or baseline utility to be able to exchange information, to be able to trade, to be able to transact, to be able to share data securely. Some of these things we're thinking very hard and pioneering as digital utilities, precisely to have an ability to look and link across individual platforms that may actually build on top of that. So I hope I've given you a sense uh, in a very, very expensive topic. Thank you. Thank you, Chen Hong. Um, I think you touch on a few points, and one of which is uh, regulatory frameworks, right? Uh, and I think you'll be remiss of me if I don't take the opportunity to ask um, two questions that are actually top voted questions, right? Uh, the first is on what's top of mind and what has been in the news for the past one week on digital crimes, right? Um, so we have a question from uh, and a member of the audience who asked, how can the legal framework be updated for digital crimes that are affecting ordinary bank users? And I think the obvious reference is to the recent OCBC phishing cases. So that's one, right? And digital crimes, like what you said, you know, um, it's part of the um, basket of the less attractive or negative repercussions that are brought about by digital technology. So that's one. How can the legal framework be updated for digital crimes? Okay. And the second one, um, it's by Matthew, Matthew Ting. So his comment is that Singapore has progressed in the digital space in um, several areas, but there are still areas where it can move faster. So for instance, digital payments, AI and 5G, um, why have these not taken off as fast as expected for a small and connected country, city like Singapore? No, I think these are very, very uh, uh, good questions. Um, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I probably won't answer it from sort of the legal uh, framework uh, in that sort of the legal sense uh, perspective. Um, no, I think you're right. When you look at all of these uh, issues that are occurring today, um, and I think ultimately, if Singapore wants to be a safe place, I think it should be safe, not just in the physical sense of the word. I mean, we pride ourselves, uh, but also in the digital sense of the word. Uh, I would say that there are probably a few key things to really, really think about. Uh, one, coming back to my idea of commons and porosity, the real challenge really is a lot of these are international. And even in the physical world in the past, whereby police work across boundaries is already tough, both in terms of finding actual attribution, as well as then the actual legal prosecution. Um, I think in a transnational environment today, I, I think that just accentuates a lot more. I, the ability to collaborate internationally to bring some of this you know, to identify who the perpetrators are because the reality is most of it is not from here. And then therefore, to be able to act accordingly, I think it's key. Um, secondly, within the local environment, uh, we can put in place as many mitigation measures as we can. Uh, it's a sort of a defensive move. Um, so again, it ranges from, you know, uh, some of the moves for 
you know, plus six five, meaning that, you know, if you see a plus six five today, generally means that the call is coming from overseas, it's not a local call, please be careful uh, or putting in place, you know, the required firewalls. Uh, these technical measures do help mitigate and they must be put into place to at least provide a certain defensive element. But I think anybody looking at this cyberspace in general will know that uh, the defensive measures are never foolproof. They only mitigate to a certain point. And generally, the threat uh, evolves much more quickly. And therefore, we must be nimble to try and uh, address each threat as it comes about. Uh, I don't think it will ever be perfect to be very candid, uh, but I think the speed at which we respond, I think will be key. Um, lastly, um, really, I think when you talk about the broader idea of resilience, um, the basic point about resilience cannot be just a, a centralized structure or centralized uh, sort of uh, measures put in place. And therefore, really increasing citizens' awareness, uh, citizens' tools, citizens' uh, ability to identify, I think is extremely key. And therefore, a lot of the uh, education efforts, especially for the more vulnerable, for example, the, the Singapore Digital Office and the ambassadors that really go out to the ground to really help seniors to really try and understand not just how to use digital, but at the same time, basics of cyber, cyber hygiene, so that the most vulnerable are actually best protected and given some of these basic uh, skill sets. So I hope that sort of uh, covers that first part. If I were to briefly cover the, the second piece, um, Indeed, I wish we could go much faster. <clears throat> and uh, I can't remember who was the, the person who asked that very astute question. Uh, PM me thereafter. I'm very happy to sort of uh, bring you on board and help us push this a lot faster. Um, to be philosophical, I think we are fast in some areas. Uh, for example, as far as 5G, we may not be the first wave, but definitely, you know, uh, in that close uh, group who are uh, maturing for five, uh, 5G today. I would perhaps say, generally, uh, if you say, look at e-payments, why is China, as far as e-payments, so much faster? You know, you go to a food stall at the street side, you can use uh, WeChat or Alipay to pay. And there's this funny little joke that Singaporeans going there want to pay cash. They look at you funny and says, paying cash, you must be from Singapore. Um, but therein is the nut, right? That when you are so used to the reality of today and you are so comfortable with the reality today, uh, there's a less impetus to change. And generally it is those who do not have then will leapfrog you uh, much faster. And I think that's a truism and that's all about disruption. And maybe I bring in this flip side to the reality premiere, which is this idea that I think has been sort of mentioned uh, uh, sometimes in the social medias, reality privilege. We are so used to what we are able to see today that sometimes we are a little bit blind and a little bit complacent. And those who do not have uh, the leapfrog because that digital unlocks so much more opportunities and so much more convenience and efficiencies that we otherwise would not have seen or would not have been uh, driven to, to move as quickly. Thanks. Thank you, Chun Hong. Um... You know, I really like your point about the reality premium and you just introduced another term, reality privilege. And that is a really good uh, segue into some questions we have relating to inequality, right? And I think this is where, Carlo, we would really love to hear from you as well. Um, we have some members of the audience raising very important points, you know, drawing, to, highlighting the tension between um, technological advancement, digitalization, and also uh, the very real social and economic ramifications that is caused by inequality among different segments of the population, right? So we tackle it on um, two fronts, if you will allow me to. Uh, one is on the social front and one is on the uh, work front, right? So um, according to a lot of the published research, um, typically advancement in digital technology inadvertently has led to middle-class downward mobility and thereby a declining middle-class. You know, uh, what are your observations on this? Okay, both Carlo and Chuen Hong. And what do you think, you know, needs to be done to protect or better equip the middle-class? Okay, and I think this is a problem that is not unique to the middle-class in Singapore uh, in order that, so that they will not be um, 
be even worse off or left behind in this digital revolution. So that's one, right? If we talk about social classes. The, the other one is really in the context of work. I mean, Carlo, you yourself, you have done work and you have looked at the impact of digitalization on work arrangements, for instance. So um, uh, this question, this comment is by a uh, senior research fellow, um, JJ. Um, he, so the digital economy and digitalized work process have obviously benefited firms and employees. However, less skilled workers may find themselves left out of the digital revolution. So how can we close this divide between employees who are more competent in harnessing technology and those who are less competent in doing so? So we have two segments, two big segments of the population here, the middle class, okay, and employees. So perhaps we'll, um, Carlo, would you like to go first? And then we will see if, uh, then we'll invite Chen Hong to add his comments. Sure, with pleasure. Um, uh, you know, when you look at that, when you look at segregation, there's many ways to look at it and many uh, spatial scales, many <clears throat> physical scales. So for instance, you go segregation in cities, cities in all cities they in their origin their places of integration but we all know that you know they also have many dynamics related to ghettoization ghettos in the past were very visible uh, now they're less visible we call the liminal ghettos but still nonetheless they're there we all know that some neighborhoods only cater to certain number certain people to you know to the rich to the poor to the middle class and so on and, uh, and so you got this dimension, you also got the global dimension. I think I, my, my impression is some of the things you're highlighting, some of them about the thin and middle class as a result of globalization and requires a different type of analysis. Some of them are more related to cities. And I'd like to focus a bit more on that, on inequality in, in our cities. And here as well, you know, there's an important thing. If you cannot measure, you cannot fix it as the saying goes. And so the first thing we should do is actually find new ways to better measure segregation and integration in, in our cities. And again, digital can help us do that in new ways. As I mentioned, you know, in the past, I think about the ghetto. Well, ghetto, the word ghetto comes from a neighborhood in Venice where actually the Jews were, uh, were had to live um, 500 years ago. And, uh, and you know, that name then became uh, a broader term for ghetto and ghettoization. So at the time, as I mentioned, your ghettos were physical, uh, you, you could see them. Uh, today, we don't see them physically, but uh, uh, still, you know, we got many fault lines in our cities. And um, one piece of research we've been doing uh, in different cities, including also Singapore, we've been focusing on Stockholm, on Singapore, on uh, Lisbon, and on, uh, on other cities globally, um, is use a lot of uh, digital information, in particular data from cell phones, from Twitter, and so on, geolocated geolocate tweets, to really analyze the city and try to elucidate and understand this kind of invisible fault line that are still there, these kind of liminal ghettos that are still there, even if they are, they are invisible. And, and I would say that they should be the first step in order to, to try to fix some of those issues. I don't think there's just one universal solution. We need to actually look in more detail at different cities and how they, they are faring in different parts of the world. And then with that knowledge, equipped with that knowledge, then put actions in practice. Thank you, Carlo. Chuen Hong? Um, no, thanks very much. Um, I think your observation that there has been a reduction in the middle class uh, is correct. And I alluded to that um, in the, the sort of the opening uh, comments. Um, I think there are many factors for it. Uh, I don't think it's ascribed surely to just digital. Uh, as Carlo uh, alluded to, there are many other aspects, uh, internationalization, uh, sorry, globalization, uh, because I think at the core, uh, what happens when there is an opening up uh, like trade or when there is the ability to now exchange very, 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 very easily, uh, there is always going to be a concentration. And there's always going to be a fragmentation between the haves and the have-nots. In some ways, there is always a fundamental economic principle, right? That uh, when they say comparative advantage in economics, uh, it doesn't mean that both sides gain equally. Uh, one side still gains more uh, than the other. 
And therefore, at the core of sort of the capitalist system, when there's exchange, somebody benefits a lot more. And over time, that advantage compounds. And I think that's at the core of what happens in uh, trade, globalization, and digital, and obviously in the commons space uh, as well. Um, so I think your basic point about the digital divide is a correct one. I think it's one of the same compounding factors that comes in. And again, you come back to the basic idea of this is a global game. Uh, unfortunately, and to say it very, very directly, uh, the idea of manpower, training and arbitrage. Because today, uh, it, it, the labor market is no longer so local. Uh, the labor market is international. And with it comes labor arbitrage. And then therefore the only way in which uh, a city or a country can continue to do well must be that for its core, you need to upskill. Now, upskilling, training, these sound like cliches, but they are extremely critical. <clears throat> They're the only way in which you can equalize the opportunities because you cannot equalize outcomes directly. You must equalize the, the opportunities that are available and the skill sets they have. And I think that's why there's huge push uh, everything from your individual skills, future credits, all the way to, for example, in the ICT sector, you know, helping uh, grads, uh, supporting them as far as onboarding, uh, helping mid-career change jobs, doing, uh, you know, your uh, Skills Singapore uh, upgrading classes, be it in digital marketing. As these things are extremely, extremely critical because the, the fight uh, is a global one. And therefore, I think that with our education Singapore, uh, sorry, education system in Singapore, I see no reason why uh, Singapore cannot come out uh, on top. Uh, but at the same time, I think we also must recognize that we must continue to be a place where the best and the brightest can come here and exchange ideas. And I think I alluded to the fact that Singapore uh, must continue to be that bigger country uh, that welcomes uh, the best minds to do the best creative work here in Singapore. I will then just end off by perhaps saying two other aspects that uh, no matter what you say, I think some of the inequality can never be completely bridged. And uh, that's where, again, the classical aspect of the government doing transfers to allow a certain equalization continues to be a key pillar as far as public policy is concerned. And again, that's at the core of what governments are supposed to do, that the private sector and capitalism grows the pie, and the government tries to redistribute the pie in as equitable a way as possible. And in Singapore's case, to redistribute it a lot more in the training and the skill sets and upping your, your, your uh, capabilities. I think that's where the continued bias will continue to play, the, play that role. The last point is the digital divide um, will be an issue, but only if society allows it, because I think it's a huge rallying point in which the more able in society can find it in themselves to rally and help the less able. And I think within there, there is a unique opportunity to turn that into a strength. And that that's a new element of uh, integration that uh, Singaporeans can come together as a movement uh, to make sure that everybody is digitally uh, included. Thank you. Thank you, Chuen Hong, and thank you, Carlo. We have um, we are entering the last 10 minutes of the 90 minute session. We have talked about tech itself, right? Infrastructure. We have talked about the role of governments, um, what policy and regulatory frameworks can do. We have talked about the role of researchers and academics, you know, in doing the research that help us understand the increasingly invisible ghettos and invisible fault lines. But we have not yet talked about one very important stakeholder, which is the big guys, the big boys, the tech companies themselves. Right, the creators of the technology. And we have some questions from a few of our contributors, including um, Senior Research Fellow, Dr. Chiu Han Yi, you know, that uh, basically brings our attention to the platforms, to the corporations, right? Who are the creators of what we call the digital commons. But in actual fact, today, our digital commons are really owned in reality by the mega corporations with their own priorities. Uh, that could be in opposition to developing or growing a space that is truly public, that is truly egalitarian, and that's truly empowering. So how should cities negotiate this tension? What should we do? 
what can we do? So who would like to go first? We need to talk about the big boys when we talk about tech. Definitely Carlo should go first. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Happy, <clears throat> happy, happy to do it. Um, well, um, it seems to me there's something interesting emerging. First of all, you know, the thing about big tech is mostly related to the fact that here you got something which is different than what happened in the past in traditional uh, entrepreneurial activities, where you got diminishing returns. Here, for the first time, we got this kind of uh, monopolies or kind of monopolies that are created just because of standards, because you're controlling the platform, you know, because there's no alternative. You know, if you, if you, if you, there's a platform, whatever it is that's used for something, you know, and that is the main, uh, it becomes a standard, then, you know, you've got something that gets very close to, to a monopoly. And that was have been giving all the tech companies so much power over the past few, few decades. Um, now, what could be an antidote to that? Well, clearly, uh, regulation, national regulation, supranational regulation. I think the EU, Margaret Vestager in particular, has been doing a lot of work in this sense and actually uh, trying to change a bit the way uh, big business operates. Uh, so that's one vector. Uh, I would offer another vector if we go in, in this direction. Let's see, that seems to be very interesting is actually cities. Well, cities have emerged over the past few decades. Some of the main actors on the global stage, you know, when you see you know, gatherings and meetings of mayors, they are getting more and more similar to heads of states. You know, mayors are, are more, have more and more decisions. There's been a process of devolution to cities and big cities having a big impact uh, in, uh, in the decision-making process on the global economy. And what I'm seeing is cities actually teaming up together, trying to uh, create organization, create, uh, uh, you know, ways in order to work together, create their own standards, and then being able just because they got enough critical mass to impose their way of doing things onto big tech. So again, you know, if you had only one city, it would be so easy to dismiss it. But if you start having like coalitions uh, of cities, think about C40, uh, I believe Singapore is part of C40, the 100 biggest cities globally, you know, then there's, there's a lot of power there. So if C40 were to, to propose something and impose something you know, that, then big tech would, uh, would certainly have to look at that very carefully uh, if they want to keep being in business. Uh, <clears throat> so those are a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of thoughts about you know, how this could, uh, uh, how one could fight uh, some of this. Uh, there could be other things, but you know, maybe I'll leave it to, for, for the discussion later. But, uh, but, but, but certainly a positive thing is really the fact of other actor coalescing and uh, then getting more critical mass that can help uh, balance the big power of big tech. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you for your points on the role of regulation, not just at the national level, but at the supranational level. Um, Trent Hong, over to you. So actually, I completely agree with um, Carlo. Um, I think the EU is moving uh, ahead, actually, uh, quite aggressively with the Digital Services Act, as well as the Digital Markets Act and starting to coalesce around some elements of uh, regulation uh, with regards to the big companies. Um, again, I'll just sort of take a step back that I say that, again, at the fundamental core, um, because these things are common and transnational companies, and I couldn't agree more, Carlo, that the international cooperation to set the rules and norms are extremely key uh, to be able to have that critical mass to address some of the common uh, these amenities, because I think we have to recognize that in many ways, companies are driven by corporate profits. And therefore, when it comes to interests, uh, not always are interests uh, aligned. And where necessary, then regulation must come into play uh, to address these issues. But again, I'll also flip it to the other side that um, as a small country, and again, as a small city as well, uh, we also want to make sure we have the space to work with uh, the platforms and to take that discussion forward in a generative manner. The overall zeitgeist, I think, in uh, Europe has turned to be one whereby it's anti-tech. Um, but I think we also want to take a much more calibrated approach here to then work with tech. So, for example, if we look at AI as a huge area of uh, uh, concern and how do you want to make sure that it is uh, done in a way uh, that is fair, uh, we, we need to and we must and actually today we are engaging uh, with the tech companies in a collaborative yet competitive mode to further 
uh, the interest, and especially with Singapore as a trusted location, which they find value in, how do you make sure that the products, you know, the services uh, do start to address some of these issues from a governance uh, perspective? So I think that's the sort of the, the second half. Then the last half, uh, I don't know whether I should sort of leave sort of this entire session with this, is perhaps a little bit more philosophical, which is actually it's not so much the platforms. Uh, ultimately, it's about the data. Because in the past, uh, say data was concentrated in governments, uh, but now increasingly that control of data has transferred to platforms. And many people give away that data for free in exchange for free email or free social media. And increasingly, if you really look at data, uh, I would say data is uh, the new capital. Uh, some people say it's a new norm, I disagree, but data is a new capital because the more it gets circulated, the velocity of data, just like you say, the velocity of capital, data markets, then ultimately that is at the core of what is what Carlo mentioned, at the core of that potentially monopolistic behavior. And as technology improves, there are two key areas that we really want to think about. One, how do we then allow individuals to start owning and aggregating and having better control of this data? It's not an easy question to answer. Uh, it's something that we're thinking very hard about. Technology does help. Blockchain does help a little bit. Discussions about what they call data pods, how you put together as data trusts. Some of these are going to be groundbreaking activities that are required going forward to think about what is that framework around data overall. And the second thought I'll leave you with is that, you know, uh, that framework for data is extremely critical. Why? Because again, if I look at history, one of the things that got capitalism right started right was sorting out something called property rights and when property rights became clear a lot of things fell into place now how do we think then about what are the economic rights with regards to data who owns it how is that shared is there also a responsibility not just to own but also a responsibility to share who does that reside with that is a huge area that i think uh is deserving of uh, thought, and it's a huge area in which we are thinking about. So uh, again, uh, just some thoughts for consideration. Thank you. Uh, but really, I just want to maybe take this opportunity for the one minute roundup uh, on your thoughts, right? I, I mean, we obviously have talked about, uh, we've covered a wide range of issues from the participant of um, citizens, you know, uh, in designing spaces, in uh, open policy making. We've also talked about the role of research. We've talked about the role of regulation and different policy frameworks. Um, I think it has uh, been a very, very good discussion. So just to end off this session, um, in order for cities not to be obsolete, in order for cities like Singapore to grow in its vibrancy, um, what is the one thing, you know, on your wish list, wish list you know, one thing that you feel that we have to do in order to make that to fulfill that vision i know it's a very big question um just one thing maybe um, just because we are at the end oh no go, go ahead, go ahead. i know just because we are at the end i would say the three most important things are citizen citizen and citizen so really starting from people well, I was going to use A, so I was going to go back and say ambition, ambition, ambition. I mean, ultimately, digital opens up the space for cities, and what's stopping us is our own uh, ambition, more so for Singapore. So we got six ideas. <laughs> six ideas, two words, ambition and citizen. Thank you so much uh, for uh, to two of you, you know, for joining us at this panel, and thank you to um, the audience. Uh, who has been staying with us. Um, my apologies once again for that failed connection, but um, have a great evening and we hope you've enjoyed the discussion. And Chun Hong and Carlo, uh, our great thanks to your very, very valuable insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Carol. Thanks, Carlo. And thank you, everyone. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>